Welcome everyone. As you are um, coming into the webinar, if you would just in the chat, um, introduce yourself um, and tell us where you're joining from. Uh, and on the chat, uh, as you comment, please make sure that it is defaulted to everyone and not just the host and panelists so that you can interact with um, everyone here in this room. Uh, we're excited to have you. I see um, somebody from Michigan already. Um, hi, Nicole. She's our social, social studies supervisor there in Broward. Um, we've got people coming to us, um, Pembroke Pines, uh, Illinois, Detroit, Broward County, a lot of representation thus far. Welcome, Milwaukee. Uh, some of our Epic friends are here, uh, Massachusetts, um, Waltham, Massachusetts, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, again, as you're coming into the webinar, uh, just make sure and introduce yourself in the chat, tell us where you're joining from, and then we will get started. It's 7.30, so I would like to go ahead and uh, introduce myself and get us started. Uh, my name is Dalton Savage, and I am the Education Coordinator for Project EDGE. Um, we are one of the newest grants for the National Council for History Education, um, and we primarily service teachers in um, Broward County, Florida. Uh, so welcome to our EDGE teachers, secondary folks. This is your first webinar with us. We want to say welcome. Um, here with us, I have Chelsea Gutierrez, who is our um, ed specialist for um, EDGE, or uh, pardon me, our curriculum specialist for EDGE. And then I have Shauna, um, who's here with us, uh, and she is our education coordinator um, for Osceola um, and Brevard counties uh, and her project lead. I also um, have Dr. Margaret Ellen Newell here um, from Ohio State University and she will be leading our webinar tonight. So I wanna go over a couple of things before we get started. Um, again, I just wanna say welcome. Uh, welcome to all of our um, EDGE family and then welcome to our other grants and uh, other people that are joining from all over. We've already, we've the chat is um, blowing up, which is great. So if you have questions or thoughts or resources that come to mind during this conversation, please share them in the chat. Um, and the other thing, Chelsea will be leading a Q&A, um, and if you would, just add it to the question um, portal, and then we'll be able to go through that at the end. We'll have our presentation, and then the end will be um, a few minutes to discuss questions that you do have. Uh, one of the other things that I want to mention is we have a webinar that's coming um, next week. Um, so next week, uh, our webinar is going to be focused on um, the melting pot. Uh, so we'll be doing a little bit of food history. Um, that's going to be really exciting. Make sure to go to NCHE Teach and then go to the webinars. You can join us there. Um, and so uh, one last thing that I want to make sure that you do is there is a survey at the very end, right? So once I hit the stop recording, there will be a survey. Please fill that out for us. It helps us to, um, you know, see what you enjoyed about the programming and what we can do to improve. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, this is Brethren by Nature, New England Indians, Colonists, and the Origins of American Slavery. Um, we have, again, uh, Margaret Ellen Newell uh, with us. She received her AB in History and Spanish from Broward University uh, and her MA and PhD in Early American History from the University of Virginia. Ohio State University named her a Distinguished Scholar in 2020. Um, her research and teaching interests include Colonial and Revolution, uh, Area America, Native American history, slavery, the history of capitalism, and Latin American history. Um, her most recent book, Brethren by Nature, New England Indians, Colonists, and the Origins of American Slavery, Cornell Press, um, won the 2016 James A. Raleigh Prize from the Organization of American Historians for the best books on the history of race relations in the U.S., and the 2016 Peter Gomez Memorial prize from the Massachusetts Historical Society. She's given dozens of public talks and recorded radio interviews and podcasts on Indian and American or African slavery. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Margaret uh, and have her present for us. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking time at the end of what I'm sure is a long work day for all of you to join this discussion. And I do hope that you will put questions in the Q&A and I'll try to make sure we leave time to address your questions and interests. Uh, so I'm about to share my screen and show you some 
images of primary sources, uh, things you might even be able to use in your classrooms um, to talk about these topics with your students. Right. So um, this map on this slide shows you some of the um, nations and groups that I'll be talking about and where they were located in Southern New England. So, um, and you know, what, one of the things I try to do with my students is, is talk about maps and sometimes how difficult it is to find a map that doesn't have state lines already drawn in and, um, you know, contemporary place names and so on. Um, you, know, it, it, you know, it conveys a sense that history was already written or that everything was leading to the history and the, the maps, et cetera, that we see now. So sometimes it's fun to just sort of try to create something out of Google maps or look for one of those maps that doesn't have the state lines. So today I'm going to talk to you about the a, a different kind of origin stories for American slavery, and one that focuses on Native Americans, and one that focuses on the North. So I know many of you are listening from Florida, from Michigan, from other places around the country, and I would say that every region has has unique stories about um, both indigenous slavery and African slavery. And um, so by talking about this unique story, we can discuss some of the differences and similarities um, across different slave regimes. So let me just start with a, a little overview. And uh, that is, I just, I just feel like I, I like to start by sharing these, uh, you know, mind-bending numbers. And that is that historians are now estimating that somewhere between 2.5 and 5 million Native Americans were enslaved in the Americas over the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. So this is less than the approximately 12 million um, uh, Africans who were enslaved and, and trafficked in the global slave trade, but it's still a gigantic number. And as a proportion of population, it's actually a higher proportion of Native Americans, uh, of the Na Native American population. So, you know, the question is, so why don't we know more about this? And why were scholars so slow to investigate these questions? And I think there's a lot of complicated reasons for that, and I'll try to address some of these uh, reasons along the way. I will Dr. say that. Um, oh, can yes. you um, go ahead and switch to presenter mode, if you would? Um, we're seeing the whole, um, the whole, the whole presentation, if you would. Yeah. Sure. Better. Um, I'm I'm seeing your notes there, so um, if you would just go um, back to the to the main screen, and then um, yeah, up at the top where it says. Um, slideshow um, right there beside animations next to your record on the left. Um, yeah, right below okay. there. If you click okay. slideshow and then click um, present, uh, play from current slide, pardon me, play from current slide, that should go ahead and have it there for you. Um, Seems that's not working. Um, just go ahead and you can go back. Um, that's totally fine. Okay. Pardon my interruption. No, that's okay. Um, let me try one more thing. No, still going to do it. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. So we were we were talking about numbers, um, but I I I also often find that people are much more familiar with the notion of Native Americans as enslavers and slaveholders. So um, many people are more familiar with the narratives of Europeans who are taken captive by Native Americans or um, histories of of captivity involving other indigenous groups or even the slaveholding of African Americans. So I think those are stories that are, are actually people often will come to me and and express knowledge about those areas, but not so much on the of the stories of Native Americans as the enslaved. So, you know, it is true that some indigenous groups did practice captivity to replace lost population and loved ones. Um, often that often this included ritual adoption and incorporation of captives into the community as equal. So it wasn't a, a kind of chattel slavery or a, a kind of lifetime subordination for the captive. Uh, but some indigenous groups also practice slavery that's a little bit closer to chattel slavery. And we know that some of the groups particularly, you know, more adjacent to present day Florida, the, some of the Mississippian chiefdoms may have uh, practiced um, this kind of captivity um, and, and enslavement and kept people uh, slaves for life or practice sex slavery. 
and things like that. So we do know this is something that's in the indigenous in indigenous history and in the indigenous past. In some cases, in some region, it preceded uh, contacts with Native American uh, with Europeans. But we also know that colonization really changed whatever whatever system was in place. If there was a system of captivity or enslavement, or if there wasn't such a system, that contact with Europeans, with colonization, and with the uh, continental and global slave trade really transformed whatever system, whatever system indigenous groups had been uh, participating in. It stripped systems of any kind of ritual or religious or other sorts of community controls. So that captivity and integration and adoption into a um, Native American society became instead chattel slavery, became the capturing of captives in order to traffic to Europeans and so on. So, so the contact with Europeans has very transformative effects, even on those societies that were practicing some forms of captivity. So we do know that in New England, some of the uh, some of the uh, groups I showed on that first slide, the Wampanoag, um, the Mohegans, the Nipmuc, and others practiced some forms of captivity. Uh, Roger Williams, a minister who who wrote an ethnography of the early uh, New England Indians, talked about um, the fact that there were some people in the society um, that before if they were captive, before they were adopted, um, they were people with no name, and that was sort of a low a low status position. But once you were adopted, became part of a kinship network, you gained status in the society and became a regular person like everyone else. So we do know that there were some forms of captivity, um, but we also know that the uh, arrival of Europeans changed the system. And, and in ways that even Native Americans who allied with the Europeans um, noticed and, and complained about. So um, Native, uh, Europeans took Native American captives from the earliest voyages of exploration. So we know that um, uh, English and French and Spanish explorers took Native Americans captive to prove to Europeans that they had been to the New World, um, to to sometimes to sell at slave markets in the Mediterranean and elsewhere, or to take to use as interpreters on return voyages. Um, so in other words, to, to when, when colonies were being planned, people wanted interpreters, they wanted people with knowledge of the local area, and they particularly specifically took captives to bring them back, teach them European languages, and send them back with voyages of colonization and exploration. So this was a story of, if you've heard of the story of Squanto, he was one such captive um, that had that experience. Um, but the large scale enslavement of New England Native Americans took place in the context of warfare in the 1630s and again in the 1670s. So the group most associated with these, pra these practices were the colonists of Southern New England. Um, Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, and later Connecticut and Rhode Island. So pictured here are uh, a couple of, of these leaders of these early New England colonies. So in the center, we see John Winthrop Sr., who was the first governor of Massachusetts Bay and sort of chairman of the board of the uh, Massachusetts Bay Company. So you can see sort of an Elizabethan gentleman there. And this on the right is his son, John Winthrop Jr. And John Winthrop Jr. became governor of Connecticut. Uh, later. And the man on the left, for many years, um, uh, historians thought it was a Niantic sachem. So the Niantics were a group that um, occupied territory, sort of, which is now um, uh, in eastern Connecticut and western Rhode Island. But an art historian has determined that this person is actually likely um, a man named Cassa Cinnamon, also known to the English as Robin. And Katza Cinnamon uh, was a war captive in the household of John Winthrop Sr. So the Winthrops were among many New Englanders who were interested in using Native American labor. And in as early as 1634, John Winthrop Jr. and John Winthrop Sr. petitioned the government of Massachusetts for the right to keep an Indian apiece as a household servant. Now, the people that um, the Winthrops wanted to have in their household at that time were, were possibly uh, Volunteer, voluntary servants, people who had agreed to work with the uh, Winthrops and were not necessarily um, involuntary servants or slaves. But three years later, the New England colonists um, engaged in a joint operation against the Pequot Nation, uh, a Native American group that had lived in 
um, uh, southern New England, um, the coast of what is now Connecticut, near what is now New London, um, for about a thousand years. And they were a powerful group that um, had a very important role in the regional slave trade, excuse me, the regional fur trade. They had um, engaged in trade relations with the Dutch in New York, um, were, in, were interested in building relations with the English, and it had done so, uh, relationships of trade and, and potential alliance. And in 1637, the New England colonists went to war against the Pequots. Now, as in this war and in many of the conflicts that the colonists engaged with the in with the Native Americans of New England, I mean, there are often really many complex um, reasons. Um, these included, you know, the desire in some parts of the colonists to expand into these regions. Um, um, rivalries over trade and who was going to control uh, lucrative fur trade to the north, um, kind of uh, conflicts amongst Native American groups. So Native, some Native American groups actually joined the New England colonies in this war against the Pequot because of rivalries over trade with the Europeans. So there's a kind of complex matrix of causes, but um, whatever these wars, you know, whatever that complex matrix, many of these wars became wars about taking captives once they started. So even though one pretext for the war was some violent acts that the Pequots had committed against a couple of European traders um, several years before the Pequot War, the first expedition that Massachusetts sent out actually attacked Block Island, which is an island off the coast of Rhode Island. And it, the, the orders for this group were to take captives, to take as many as women, women and children and other captives as they could. Other uh, colonists noted that when uh, Connecticut colonists uh, noticed that when the, the soldiers from Massachusetts and Plymouth came, that they spent more time, you know, loading their boats with Pequots than they did um, fighting or, you know, help, helping helping the colonists who had been besieged and needed food and so on and so forth. So they, that even other Europeans were sort of complaining that there was too much of a focus on captive taking. Um, there were a couple of really climactic and violent battles in this um uh, in this war, including including an attack on a fort that's very famous. It's um, images of that are, are are often found in textbooks. But in in addition to to killing many Pequots, um, the, the colonial armies took captives and they targeted uh, women, children. Uh, they targeted places of refuge, often where um, the Pequots sent their families in order to get them away from the war. So they went after Native Americans in swamps and. Um, uh, other other villages that were were known refuge, and in fact, the Pequots tried to negotiate with the colonists about how women and children would be treated in the war, and asked if the English would attack or kill women and children. And the, the English said yes, and the Pequots were really kind of taken aback. They had tried to negotiate the rules of war, and they were uh, unsuccessful in, in reaching agreement with the, with the English. So this war ended in a terrible set of losses for the Pequot nation. And the treaty that ended the war extinguished the name of their nation um, and, and scattered surviving Pequots all over the region. So the Native American groups who had supported the English got captives, and the English took um, a lion's share of captives themselves and divided them. As I said, they did a dividend of captives, approximately 320 that I can count, although there's, there's more than that in this captive stream. Um, ended up being divided amongst really mostly the soldiers and the elite residents of the uh, New England colonies at the time. So um, why did the New England colonists want Native American captives and uh, living in their households? Because that's what they did. So we, we might have an image of Southern slavery, of plantation slavery, and that's not what this was. Um, this was household slavery. This was, uh, you know, homes that often only had one or two rooms that also included uh, many times English servants, indentured servants, people who had agreed to work for four or seven years of their lives and had signed contracts to do so. These homes would now be incorporating uh, Pequot captives who didn't speak the language, who had completely different you know, cultural systems that they were bringing with them. So, you know, when we think about um, early colonial societies, we actually have to think of them as places that were incorporating people of different ethnicities, you know, in the most intimate spaces in which they lived and living alongside them, working alongside them. Um, you're going to be learning about foodways later. I mean, this we all become corn eaters in America. Um, and, you know, the Native American women are cooking food that English English colonists are eating. They're introducing them to 
um, corn samp, which was a cornmeal stew with uh, squash and venison and other other things in it, to maple syrup and maple sugar, to um, all you know medicines that um, they had found useful, um, to all of their technologies, to food waste, to language, um, to agriculture and the agricultural techniques that the English would adopt and use. So, so the Native Americans are bringing, uh, you know, much needed, much appreciated skills uh, for navigating this new environment, technologies, and and other assets. Children are watching, uh, and and women are helping with important household tasks like childcare, like doing all these hours, hours, and hours long tasks that it took to run a colonial household, um, grinding wheat or corn into meal that could be cooked for bread, um, washing you know, gardening, uh, processing raw materials so they could be consumed by the families. So the households were places of, of backbreaking, intensive, day-long work uh, with childcare and all those responsibilities added into it. So all of these um, uh, English colonial families want labor all the time. They're always looking for it. And the servant stream from England didn't satisfy their, their intense need for labor, both within the home and in all of the other agricultural, fishing, whaling, uh, and other uh, ironworks and other sorts of, of economic and industrial activity they engaged in. So there's a, there's a, a desire for labor. And um, we do know that the 320 Pequot captives increased the, the amount of available labor in New England at this moment in 1637, 1638, by, by more than 30%. And the Pequot War came at a time when the first group of English servants were finishing their contracts and saying, bye-bye, I'm not doing this anymore. So um, I think this is an important part of the timing, the focus where the focus on captives and captive taking and, and incorporating them into households as servants and slaves. So unlike the English servants, these Pequots, there are no contracts involving these Pequots. So they were not contracted for a set amount of time. So there were not, no limits really on how long they could be held captive, uh, no legal limit as there were for these English servants. And the contracts that English servants had also talked about their treatment, what they would receive in return and so on. So none of this seems to have you know, surrounded what happened to the Pequots. So it was really up to the individual, um, the individual slaveholder to really to decide and to determine whether they would free them at a set term as they did English servants, or they would try to keep them for life. And then I see patterns of both things happen. So Cassa Cinnamon, who shows up in this earlier slide, um, worked in the Winthrop household and was in fact freed after a, a set term. He then joined um, John Winthrop Jr. and helped John Winthrop Jr. cite his planned settlement at what became New London, Connecticut. And um, by his kind of work with the Winthrops, his, um, you know, the kind of social capital that gave him, political capital that gave him in this larger colonial world, Cassa Cinnamon was actually able to, to help repatriate and, re, and uh, repopulate former Pequot territory and, and sort of bring other Pequots who had been exiled or placed as captives with other indigenous groups allied with the English. So there's a kind of repatriation of some Pequots to their former uh, to their former region because of Cassa Cinnamon's relationships, because of his work with the Winthrops. But Cassa Cinnamon's story is a, is a rather unique one. Um, Cassa Cinnamon is one of the people who helps establish the Mashantucket Pequot Reserve that still exists today and is the home of the massive, massive uh, Mashantucket Pequot tribal nation. But uh, other captives had a much more grim uh, outcome and much more grim experience than Cassa Cinnamon did. So we know that um, at least 17 New England Indians were exported to an island off the coast of Nicaragua called Providence Island. So it was another Puritan colony. Puritans also had a, some Puritans went to the Caribbean and established a colony at Providence Island and it's pictured here in this map. Um, so you see that John Winthrop noted that they, the, the colony of, of Massachusetts actually planned this voyage because they were desperate to break into the Caribbean trade and the Caribbean trade was going to sustain the New England economy. Um, uh, you know, after 1640, it was going to be how New Englanders made money. Um, farmers made products to be shipped to the Caribbean to support the, the growing and emerging plantation, agriculture, uh, and slave societies that were going to focus on tobacco and sugar and not food. 
Nogan was going to help feed them and send them the horses that would power their sugar mills. And these, these early relationships were established by this voyage that contained Pequot captives that were sold in Providence Island and exchanged, in fact, as he said, for cotton, tobacco, and, and African-American enslaved Africans. So the, this voyage of Pequots sold into the Caribbean brought enslaved Africans in return. And the colony of Massachusetts built a slave pen, kept those uh, enslaved people there, and then and then sold them um, and distributed them again to elite people in Massachusetts. So this voyage also, in some ways, you know, initiated a, a slave trade, um, another pattern that uh, we'd see in the future. So on the left, this is a, one of the earliest textiles we have, uh, Native American produced textiles that has still survived, and it's from the 17th century. And most likely woven by a Wampanoag woman um, who shows, you know, her skills. Uh, these were valued, these baskets, mats, um, buildings, uh, home construction. These are all skills that Native American women brought to both their households and to these, uh, the households of their captors. Um, but just take a moment to, to think about these Nugan Indians who are, who are dumped off on Providence Island, how distant they are from their homes in a completely different environment you know, being put to very different kinds of work, um, tobacco and sugar cultivation. And then Providence Island was conquered by the Spanish and, and taken by the Spanish. Um, the, many of the English evacuated. They took their, their slaves with them and evacuated to other English islands. But, you know, there's, there's probably also like a giant scattering of some of these uh, Navy, uh, New England Native Americans. And they're, they're broken up as a cohort. So they're isolated even from the small group that they had come from and scattered all over the Caribbean. So, you know, just imagine the trauma. This is a reverse middle passage that these and other Native New Englanders experienced. So um, one thing I, I, uh, I, that became apparent to me in doing this research was the connection between the Pequot War and Massachusetts's war, uh, law of slavery. So Massachusetts uh, produced one of the first legal codes in English America. And I would argue it also produced one of the first you know, comprehensive laws of slavery. So what interested me is that even though you know, Virginia and Barbados are, are beginning to really practice enslavement and there are, ensla there are enslaved Africans within their societies so that, that it's a kind of ad hoc and irregular um, um, process to a certain extent. And they're just beginning to to pass laws that are constructing the system of slavery in those places that we associate more with slavery. But in fact, Massachusetts lays it all out in 1641, four years after the onset of the Pequot War. And I think that the creation of this law has a lot to do with determining the status of the Pequot captives and giving permission to hold them for as slaves for life. So if you look at um, the, the beginning of the second paragraph, um, um, or the first paragraph, paragraph, excuse me. So the title is Bond Slavery. And the first line of this is that there, there shall never be bond slavery, villainage, or captivity among us. So this is a crazy thing. The law of slavery starts by saying there won't be slavery and captivity. Um, it goes on to say who could be taken captive. And if you have a chance to read it, it, it says uh, the exceptions to the rule that there'll be no bond slavery, village, villainage, or captivity is that they're, it, unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars. So war captives like the Pequots could be enslaved. Such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. So if anyone's already been enslaved by a third party and are brought to New England and sold as slaves, then they are legal slaves. Or if someone should sell themselves, they are legal slaves. Um, it says, it goes on to say that slaves will have the access to Christian usages. In other words, they can become Christian converts, but that conversion will not free them. In some places, Christian conversion actually brought freedom. This, the Puritan colony is saying, no, it, that will not bring you freedom here in the Puritan colony. And the last exception is that, um, you know, people who are judged there too by authority, that the government has the right to condemn people to slavery. So that's the last category of the enslavable. Now, what's missing from this code are a couple things. Um, a racial designation. It doesn't say that people of certain race or ethnicity can be enslaved. It also doesn't say that slavery is heritable, can, that it can be inherited, and where the children will be enslaved after the parents. This law, though, remained the code of slavery in New England throughout the colonial period. Um, we will see, we'll see in a few minutes that um, the New England colonies did pass slave codes 
little bit that brought them into um, compliance or, or put them on a similar path with some of these other contemporary slave societies, but they didn't change this basic um, set of laws that described what slavery was. So this issue of whether it could be passed down over generations, whether it was inheritable, it became a kind of constant, um, constant legal fight and a constant fight on the part of the enslaved to prevent it from happening. So we see, we'll talk about a case involving um, um, one of these battles a little bit later. So the next major um, occasion of enslavement in New England was King Philip's War, which occurred between 1675 and 1677. So like the Pequot War, this war had many important and complicated causes, but but the the existing the existence of slavery and the the ways in which slavery had really changed the relationships between Native Americans and European colonists. Uh, we know what the Native Americans complained about was like that this that they were constantly being threatened by of threatened with slavery by colonists that they you know that they had you know conflicts with that they had conflicts over borders or conflicts over trespassing or conflicts over animals grazing in Native American cornfields that they confiscated and so on that you know that the that threats of enslavement would accompany attempts to to find redress for these sorts of incidents that that you know this was sort of becoming um, a, a, a you know a, a, a kind of daily threat or daily reality that many Native Americans were experiencing, and the King Philip's War became a, a giant event for of enslavement for Native Americans, and we, we also have to look at slavery and enslavement as um, an experience that was incredibly uh, impactful and part of uh, the the ways in which colonization was really undermining. Native American kinship ties. It was uh, undermining their ability to subsist, their economic base. It was um, undermining and stealing their labor and and uh, their surplus, um, and really, you know, putting enormous stresses on Native American fertility, family formation, formation, and ability to raise and protect their own children. Um, so, in, in the context of King Philip's War. Um, what had already been a population under extreme stress, you know, um, a, bit, a population that had been about, you know, 180,000 um, when Europeans first started arriving in New England had dwindled to uh, about 12,000 by the onset of King Philip's War in Southern New England. And by the end of the war, the population would be only about 5,000. And of that 5,000, about 35% were enslaved during King Philip's War. And this um, slide shows both a quote from a, uh, a military captain that shows you some of the stuff that was going on that, you know, people were just uh, uh, units, uh, military units were just taking captives as they went, just snagging women and children and bringing them along. And then sometimes just selling them to other, other you know, military units that they cross paths with. So in this case, uh, Thomas Oliver is like saying, you know, he had a, he had a group of 47 captives and he sold them to another, uh, you know, another commander that he ran into for 80 pounds in money. Uh, so this happened in Rhode Island in 1675. On the right is a document that shows an auction of captives that was held by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the government was actually participating in enslavement, was auctioning off uh, Native Americans captured during the war. And Massachusetts actually created a special regiment that others called the privateers. So privateer is like a, you know, a, 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 an official pirate, a pirate with a, a letter that says they can be a pirate from a particular nation. They created a pirate regiment whose job was to take captives. That was its job. They were exempted from other sorts of military duty and, and it included a bunch of pirates basically. And they went around very violently um, killing, killing Native Americans and taking captives. And some of the people that they took are actually involved in this auction. So I know that one of the buyers at this auction was a man named, a merchant named Samuel Shrimpton. And Samuel Shrimpton uh, bought nine captives at the auction um, to send to Jamaica. But he said, I think to keep three of them upon Noddles, Noddles Island, Ye Island. So this is an island in Boston Harbor. Um, so Shrimpton uh, bought, you know, was going to send some of these New England Native Americans to Jamaica to toil in the sugar fields there alongside enslaved Africans. And the others he was going to keep and use on his farms there in um, Boston Harbor. 
And if you see, if you look in the background of this uh, uh, portrait that Shrimpton had painted of himself, you can see there's an enslaved African man in, in the background. So African slavery and 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 uh, uh, Native American slavery are, are existing, are coexisting together. They're intertwined in important ways. But in this period, Native Americans are still far, by far the largest part of the enslaved population. Enslaved Africans are expensive. They are, are hard to get. And they're not much of a supply is reaching any of the English colonies, much less the Northeast. So, um, you know, very wealthy people like Shrimpton have access to um, enslaved Africans, but they have much greater access to uh, enslaved Indians. So um, others of these enslaved uh, people that were sold at auction in both Massachusetts and in Plymouth Colony, which was a separate colony of this period, ended up in the Mediterranean. So um, this is a slide that shows the at that time the English port of Tangier in North Africa. And um, one of the naval officers that was stationed at this port went to the slave markets of Spain in order to shop for galley slaves, people to row English galleys in the Mediterranean. And he bought a bunch of native New Englanders that were sold at this giant slave market in Cadiz, Spain. And he writes that, in my opinion, they are as good, if not better, than the Moorish slaves. Good, if not better, than African slaves. So New England Indians actually built this breakwater in Tangier, and they rode these galleys, you know, on diets of, you know, Hamilton mentions that like, you can't even feed them. These, they're eating, they're, they basically barely have bread and water, and they're rowing these galleys. So they're, you know, engaging in this horrible backbreaking work in this, you know, place you know, so incredibly isolated from friends and family. Um, another group of Native New Englanders ends up in uh, the Azores Islands, which are these volcanic islands off, really off the coast of West Africa, uh, at that time claimed by Portugal. Uh, but you can see how distant they are from, from North America, how, uh, how they're sort of both involved in that trade with Africa and also in trade with the Mediterranean. So a number of New England Indians are shipped to uh, the Azores. So the reason these people are ending up in, in the Mediterranean and the Azores is because these are the places that New England merchants were trading with at that moment. So the people are taking these enslaved Indians and selling them where they're going anyway. And um, at this time, the Caribbean had actually banned, um, didn't want New England Indians being taken there because they saw them as rebellious and they might cause slave rebellions in Barbados or Jamaica or other English islands. And also um, the New England authorities were trying to keep merchants from taking food to the Caribbean. So they were banning voyages on their end um, and trying to get them to go find, find more food because they were experiencing a food shortage. So many fields and crops were, had been destroyed in the war and in the battles. So this is why, this is sort of the accident in some ways of why some of these Native Americans end up in Tangier, end up in Spain and end up in the Azores Islands. So, um, so these are like very spectacular and you know heartbreaking examples of that reverse middle passage, like those Pequots that ended up in Providence Island, of these people getting shipped to North Africa and shipped to the Azores and to Europe and elsewhere. But um, the vast majority of Native Americans are, are kept in English households, right? So this is true of the Pequots too. Like a, a small fraction are exported, but most are kept to labor in English homes. Um, and, and we see, you know, we see the, uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island colonies actually didn't hold giant auctions. They actually divided the captives, um, in the towns based on what their tax rolls were. So they're creating this new class of slaveholders by these, by these distributions of captives widely in places like Rhode Island and Connecticut. They're holding um, small auctions on, on docks and people are buying these Native American children on, on these dockside auctions. So there, you know, there's sort of a, a you know, widespread phenomenon of people becoming slaveholders because of these captives in King Philip's War. And this, this uh, increasing number of Native American slaves is also being accompanied by an increase in the trade in enslaved Africans particularly after 
1690, and, and even more so as we move into the 1700s. Um, partly this is because England became involved in the slave trade directly. So it's bringing more, um, more, more enslaved people to North America, but also because New Englanders themselves are starting to become more involved in the direct slave trade to Africa or to trade with places like the Azores where they're picking up captives and the Caribbean as well. So beginning in the 1680s and 90s and through the 1720s, New England colonies start passing slave codes. And these slave codes uh, included curfews. They included uh, prohibitions on enslaved people bearing arms. They included special courts to try offenses involving these people and a kind of stripping of other sorts of important uh, civil and human rights. And these laws generally included both Native Americans as well as Africans. So they would apply to both Indian and African servants and slaves. So they were, they were racialized laws that were putting all these people into a separate category of, of personhood, a reduced category of personhood from even English servants. We're now going to be in a superior, much more superior legal position than even in a Native American indentured servant. That person would be covered by these slave codes. So these slave codes were, were huge markers of, of what slavery meant in the rest of the Atlantic world. The Spanish, the French, and the English all, all passed versions of these laws. So, you know, this was a, a real loss of, 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 of a, a even further loss of, of status and humanity for, for those Native Americans held in slavery. So we can see the ways that the, the rising numbers of enslaved Africans is, was really affecting um, New England Native Americans, was, was really making their position even worse and more tenuous and, and putting them into this uh, kind of fungible category with all enslaved people. Um, that um, their Native American identity didn't matter, their attachment to New England didn't matter. Now, these were very controversial moves, and the inclusion of Native Americans in these laws, though, prompted a lot of controversy. And that's what this quote shows, that Samuel Sewell writes that, I essayed, I tried to prevent Indians from being raided with horses and hogs. The law that Sewell was upset about was a law that was going to categorize Native Americans and Africans as... Um, as animals, as things, for purposes of taxation, rather than as people. Um, a lot of these um, communities used um, poll taxes, capitation taxes, like the, you basically, as a, as a parent, as a householder, you were taxed for the number of people in your home. And you had to pay a tax on your children, and you had to pay tax on your servants. But they're saying that um, Native Americans and African Americans would now be taxed the way your horses were, or your hogs were, or your domestic animals were or your possessions were. They're turning people into possessions by these laws. That was their purpose, and Sewell knew it. And he and others tried to fight the inclusion of Native Americans in these laws. He lost, and Native Americans became raided as hogs and horses for tax purposes. But um, the laws that aim to keep um, Native Americans and African Americans from marrying, um, from intermarrying with um, uh, Europeans, um, those those face more challenges. So interestingly, enslaved people in America, whether they were in or New England, whether they were African or or Native American, retained the right to testify in court and the right to uh, marry. Um, Africans lost the right to marry white people, so they could not marry English people, but they could marry each other. And this right to marriage in slavery is is a really kind of a unique is a rather unique right for. Uh, the enslaved people in New England, as was the right to testify in court, you know, a very important right that was going to become important as they tried to battle the conditions of their enslavement. So we see the different ways that that Native American slavery did create the you know the inclusion of Native Americans, the fact that slavery in New England was built on on Native American population, you know, meant that they kept this law in place from the Pequot War. So slavery remained, you know, a not clearly inheritable thing. People retained this the right to marry and the right to testify in court and the rights that enslaved people lost in most other regions of English America and French America. So, you know, there's a, a distinct regime that in some ways made life better for enslaved African Americans, even as the presence of the enslaved really was changing um, was changing conditions for Native Americans. 
And I'll add though, that there's also quite a bit of intermarriage between Native Americans and African Americans. And this has lots of consequences for these communities. Um, Native American communities became places of refuge for black runaways, um, places that they could go, places they could find protection, places that free people of color could find socialization, enjoyment, fun, uh, fairs, economic opportunity. But uh, intermarriage with Africans and biracial children face a constant, constant threat of enslavement um, and always put people in, 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 in much trickier positions. And when they, when they uh, were biracial, when Indian women married Native American men and had children with them, um, there, there was always a threat that they would lose some of the protections that ingenuity, indigeneity brought to free Native Americans in places like Rhode Island, which banned the enslavement of Indians after um, King Philip's War. Now, we, we do know, I know for your Floridians, that the other place that um, New Englanders went to enslave uh, was, in fact, La Florida. So between 1680 and 1720, the colonization of the Carolinas and Georgia um, involved the widespread slaving in, in the American Southeast. And this was actually a kind of a process of colonization involved the uh, enslavement of Native Americans, mass enslavement, widespread enslavement, and wars of enslavement were kind of what paid for colonization, what attracted uh, very early colonists, involved the colonists from Virginia as well. So this is like this is a this is a kind of free for all of of, of violence and um, slaving kind of versions of what went on in the Pequot War and King Philip's War are going on a much larger scale, involving much many more groups, also involving indigenous allies in many cases who are taking captives to sell to the English and Europeans. And this created a, an incredibly violent and, and difficult experience for many um, indigenous groups in La Florida, like the and and the Carolinas, like the uh, Tuscarora, the Yamasi, uh, the Tucuman. You know, many groups um, really you know shattered by this sort of constant violence and constant enslavement. So, um, through a court case that involved the son of a woman named Betty, named Elisha, in 1750, I found the story of this young girl named Betty who told about being taken captive in from. Um, uh, by English uh, and English allied Native Americans um, as her family had been sheltering in a Spanish mission and the mission came under attack. She and her mother uh, tried to escape and run for their freedom. Her mother, her mother took her into a river and was trying to swim across the river and they shot her mother through the body and killed her. And little Betty, uh, this little girl continued to try to swim, but they took her and many others, both old and young. And Betty narrated this terrible journey from the interior to the coast in which the their captors chopped off the heads of old people who couldn't keep up, um, you know, killed people along the way, sold people along the way for food and ended up in, you know, it was probably either uh, Savannah or Charleston, they sold the captives to English traders, colonial traders. And those traders brought uh, Betty up to Providence, Rhode Island or Newport, Rhode Island where she was sold at auction and ended up being resold and ended up in Connecticut. And that's where I encountered her story. Um, other Spanish Indians or Indians from Florida also ended up trafficked to New England during this period, as did Wabanaki people from the very northern parts of New England. So other places where the English were in, involved in colonization or warfare, um, captives were flowing uh, in and between English colonies. So that if we, you know, we, we talked about a reverse middle passage into the Caribbean, into Europe, there's also a, a giant continental passage going on where Native Americans are being trafficked um, over a great distance. And, and here you could really also talk about Detroit, you could talk about um, um, other, other regions, so the Southwest, other regions of North America, there's just a widespread um, indigenous slave trade going on that mirrors in some ways what's going on within Africa. And even that trip from the interior to the coast is something that Africans experienced. So about 60,000 um, indigenous people from Southeastern United States were actually shipped out of Charleston, South Carolina, more than Africans entered between 1680 and 1720. So this, um, this newspaper you know, describes some of these battles and you can see these large numbers of prisoners and, and slaves. At the, so this is a Boston newspaper that's covering 
these 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 wars and the slave taking uh, that's being perpetrated by Virginians and Carolinians against these indigenous groups. Uh, and here's a slave ad that shows a very likely Indian woman who's being sold in Boston, that she's 23, that she speaks good English, that um, she's had smallpox, that she's fit for town or country service. She can sew, card, spin, and do all sorts of household work. So this this demonstrates a woman that you know has has learned English, but you know perhaps lost an indigenous language. That's been in a lot of contact with English colonists by the, by the eighteenth century. That's learned these other skills and other um, uh, you know household tasks. In other words, that this shows somebody who's been exposed to European culture for a long time. So I know Chelsea's got some questions lined up, and I did want to lead leave you with one more. Um, one more slide, because um, I mentioned earlier that I found Betty's case um, uh, in a in a file, court file that involved her son. And that's because her son sued for his freedom based on Betty's story and her story being kidnapped from um, from La Florida. And what I, I start seeing in the 1730s, 40s and 50s is a number of Native Americans who bring lawsuits and sue for their freedom um, based on the fact that slavery shouldn't and couldn't have been inheritable based on some of the, the um, laws and restrictions surrounding the distribution of captives in Connecticut and Rhode Island. And this uh, case involving a man named Caesar in 1739, uh, Caesar found success in claiming that his mother had been illegally enslaved and therefore he was not born a slave. Uh, a Connecticut jury agreed with him and Caesar not only won his freedom, but he also sued for reparations and won reparations. And Caesar may have learned about the story and about this strategy from a, a young woman who had been enslaved by the same slaveholder um, several years earlier, who also managed to run away. She'd been illegally, she was a free person who'd been illegally trafficked into Connecticut and had been changed from a Native American into an African in the papers of her enslavement, um, which is something that often happened, just like kidnapping and, and, a, and a change in someone's ethnic status. And she sued for her freedom and won and also got reparations. So I think we can also talk about how, um, the, you know, how Native Americans resisted enslavement, how they, um, how, how many of them became embedded in, in communities and, and, and established social relationships with the larger New English community um, that in, in these jury trials sided with them against slaveholders. So I'd say let's move on to the Q and A and talk a little bit more about um, things that interested all of you. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was really fascinating. I know that I took a lot of notes. I learned so much. I uh, just really appreciate your time. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to send them over in the Q&A button. Um, Margaret, if you don't mind just going ahead and stopping your share, your screen share. Um, our first question is, um, were more Pequots that were enslaved released after a certain term, such as a number of years, or were more enslaved for their entire lives, which was the more common practice? I think that it was more common to enslave people for their entire lives. So a couple of um, people in the Winthrop household, several, several so Winthrop, you know, lists he lists nine Indians in a in a draft will in 1639, um, Winthrop Senior, and he doesn't mention that. Usually, if there were servants, there would be you would mention, um, you would say this person has four years left, or and, and he didn't mention any of those things. So you know, I I, I think. Um, um, most of the other people that I've encountered seem to be being held for life. Um, and some are, 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 you know, being held for New England, in New England for 10 years and then being resold. So, I mean, I think it's possible that there's other people who are, who, who are maybe released. Some, so some of the men, other men that the Winthrop's hold, they do release, but they're keeping, you know, nine others. So I, my, my supposition is that most are being held. There are still there are petitions in the 1670s when the war starts, the King Philip's War starts. You know, there's a kind of backlash against the keeping of these servants for security reasons, and a lot of people petition how they've they've had these servants for many years. Like so, in other words, they, these are people that have Pequot captives still, and they don't want to get rid of them. So, 
Thank you. And then our next question is, uh, was there a group of American colonists that sought out the Native Americans um, as slaves the most? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, for, for, I'd say in terms of, I, you know, I, I'd say the, the New England colonists are very consistent about seeking out uh, enslaved African, enslaved uh, Native Americans. But I'd say just for sheer volume, uh, Virginia and South Carolina. Um, you know, when we think about the that the enslaved population of Virginia is is you know is also largely Native American for much of the 17th century, and and they're just the numbers are just much greater because the the um, you know their their use in um, plantation agriculture is greater. I mean, the Carolinas it's very intense too. That's where a lot of that that 60,000 a lot of those people are. Are being taken captive by the Carolinians and um, and in early Georgia too. So you know, I think there's the there's the numbers are just much greater in the southeast. So where you you know in La Florida, that's where the action is. Um, you know, the Spanish are of course taking uh, are, are are really dwarfing these numbers uh, with what's going on in the Caribbean and in uh, uh, Mexico and South America. The English are taking a lot of Indian slaves in the Caribbean too, so that the uh, the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, Central American, Mexican uh, Indians from Mexico are all funneling into the Caribbean. So about ten percent of all enslaved people in the Caribbean were Native American, which you know again ten percent doesn't sound huge, but like uh, most enslaved people, most enslaved Africans ended up in the Caribbean. That is the giant place that's absorbing a lot of uh, the, is absorbing the global slave trade. So. And was there any pushback at the time for keeping Native Americans as slaves from the communities? From the Native American communities? Yes. Uh, yes, there was. Um, uh, so uh, the the even the groups that allied with the English in the Pequot War were sort of uh, upset about how the the Pequots in Massachusetts were being treated because they said the they said the captives should be given homes, they should be given houses, and 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 land. And and you know settled there. So when the when the Narragansetts and the Mohegans thought about taking captives, they thought they wanted population. They wanted you know followers. They wanted you know to increase their community. So there's almost like a mass adoption of 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 population is how they were thinking about captivity. You know allies. You know maybe tributaries. So they weren't thinking about chattel slavery. So they're they're taken aback with what the English do. So there is criticism always from indigenous groups about the processes all the way through. And then um, there are you know, a handful of um, colonists, but never nothing, nothing very substantial until the 18th century. And did you do you know how the legacy of Native American slavery continues to impact Native American communities today? Yeah, I mean, they're all very, you know, they're very interested in this history. I mean, they talk, you know, they talk about the history and want to make those sorts of connections. You know, I think, I think the, um, you know, it's part of the larger story of colonization and and the the impacts on language, um, you know, which which many of these nations had to have had to engage in language reclamation um, fairly recently, um, often using printed materials from. English colonization and evangelization to try to reconstruct their own languages. Um, you know, Native, Native men were deployed in very dangerous occupations, uh, warfare, fishing, whaling, separated from families. So the family separation, female headed households, poverty and vulnerability, um, you know, just loss of population uh, through enslavement, through the breakup of families. That, you know, these are these are traumas that I think affect people in in both direct and indirect ways. So I, I think that legacy of slavery is something that these that present day groups like the Wampanoag um, and Pequot are really think about a lot and talk about and and discuss. And this is our last question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything today, everyone. Um, uh, why are there so few accounts of indigenous enslavement recorded in American history books, even at the university level? You know, I think it's, uh, you know, I started this project because I found some of these documents and I was teaching courses and not talking about indigenous slavery. It wasn't even in my, the textbooks I was using. So I think it's partly because slavery, the Civil War and the experience of the Civil War um, you know the 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 
the emancipation, um, you know, I think it, 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 it created this very strong association between African heritage and slavery and um, that, that, that carried forward so that the, the knowledge of indigenous slavery, and there were a lot of people writing about it and thinking about it and early abolitionist groups talked about indigenous slavery. I, I think that kind of over, overwhelmed and overcame um, some, of, some of that history. I think some of it's intentional. I think it's part of a purposeful forgetting of, of Northern complicity in slavery and, and, it, and indigenous slavery is a big part of that Northern complicity and his, and history in the 17th and 18th century. So it's an intentional erasure that happens around the time um, when uh, it happens in the early 1900s, actually, when when people are also start to start writing, historians start writing positively about African slavery and saying it wasn't so bad is when they start erasing this history of indigenous slavery. So I think there's a sort of a, you know, a, a connection between that, that Jim Crow era, um, early 20th century, literal whitewashing of, of this, this larger history of slavery. And the last thing I'll say is some of it's because of our focus on plantation slavery and, and scale and plantation records providing a lot of the material that we write about and think about when we think about slavery. But most of the enslaved in America were lived in households, you know, including through the Civil War. So we don't know as much about that history. We need to. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, again, really appreciate um, you joining us tonight. And I wish we could keep going with questions because we have more in the queue. So I'm so sorry about that. Um, before people hop off, though, um, I do want to mention that um, for everyone, when you click in here in a few, there will be a survey for you. Please fill that out. That helps us um, be able to see what you're going to uh, take from this webinar. And then also for edge specific friends, um, you have some reflection questions that are posted on our Canvas page. Um, if you would fill those out for us um, and get those back to us next week. Um, again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Noel, for uh, your expertise um, and sharing uh, what you know for um, us with an or for um, what you know um, about this topic with us for about an hour. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Have, have a good night.